I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. Ironically enough, one of the biggest challenges surrounding cyber defense in the industrial sector is a lack of data. Data about the attacks, the attackers, their tactics, and how they were able to successfully orchestrate the onslaught of ransomware, phishing, and malware schemes that are costing manufacturers millions of dollars and priceless amounts of downtime. Working to overcome the lack of transparency accompanying such attacks and the valuable takeaways they can provide is our guest today. Jack Resider is the host and founder of the Darknet Diaries podcast, where he takes listeners on a journey through the world of hacking, data breaches, and cyber crimes. He's talked to hackers, phishing scheme experts, NSA agents, penetration testers, and just about any other player you can imagine in helping to lift the veil on cyber attacks. It's our pleasure to welcome Jack to Security Breach. Maybe to get things going a little bit, you can talk about um, what you do at Darknet Diaries and kind of how you got started on the cybersecurity side of things. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm the uh, creator of the podcast Darknet Diaries, which is a show that um, interviews people who were who were there at some <laughs> some sort of crazy um, cyber event, right? So whether a breach or um, an incident of some kind. And I sometimes interview the, the interview the incident responders. I sometimes interview the criminals. I sometimes interview the law enforcement that's involved. And I want to have like that firsthand experience of what was going on there. It's kind of like true crime meets cyber crime. And uh, yeah, this is what I do full time. But before that, I was um, a network security engineer for 10 years. Oh, interesting. So kind of a natural progression and uh, sort of taking it to the next level in terms of everything that's going on with cybersecurity now. Well, I don't know if it's natural. Um, I, I, I guess I had in mind like maybe, you know, subject matter expert or manager at some point. And somehow I think I veered off and went into content creator. Um, but yeah, this is this has really been a, a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, I've become a big fan of the podcast myself just because one of the issues that we have specific to the industrial sector is, well, I guess it's twofold. Number one, people really fear the transparency or really sharing a lot of details when they do get hacked. And we know, especially since the pandemic began in, in 2020, early on, there's been a huge uptick in attacks within the industrial sector. Colonial Pipeline got a lot of attention. The JBS hack got a lot of attention. But one of the things that I appreciate about the show is it sort of lifts the veil a little bit. When you're talking to people about some of the attacks that they've experienced and some of the things that have played a part in all of those attacks, what have been some of the biggest takeaways or what do you feel are some of the benefits in sort of sharing some of that information and, and getting past maybe a little bit of the potential, some of the concerns that come with sharing that information? Like sharing, like we've been, we've been hit and here's, what, here's how much ransom we've paid or what level of sharing are you talking? I think just as much, you know, in listening to the podcast, people, there is a lot of information that's put out in terms of we got hit. This was the vulnerability that was exploited. This is what we did in response. Yeah. So I think with um, with some of these companies you listed, um, I mean, we're talking about the dark side group and our evil group. And these people actually go and listen in on earnings calls for some of these publicly traded companies and hear like, hey, have you had a really good year this year? Are you doing really well financially? And if so, they're looking for those juicy targets and then figuring out a way to get into those places. I mean, this is this is what we've seen from them, right? So already we've got sharing information before you're even breached. Um, how much of that are you willing to share, right? So I think, uh, yeah, and, and you know, sometimes I've looked up um, people on LinkedIn, such as, you know, chief technology officer of some of these companies that got hit, and they list all kinds of um, skills that they're good at, right? SAP version 7.2, you know, <laughs> and uh, Oracle version this and that. And it's like, wow, if, if I just look at what the, the chief information officer's skills are, I can actually see what um, technologies this company has that they work at, right? Because you can clearly yeah. match it up. So, um, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of just open source intelligence gathering you can do before the breach even happens. But I do feel like, um, you know, after someone's breached, there is um, there is some some directions you can take as far as PR goes. Right. Um, I was um, I think I was a user of Newegg and didn't know Newegg got breached. <laughs> and I was upset yeah. about that. Right. Like, what's going yeah. on here? How come you didn't tell me this? Right. So you, you have upset customers, you have upset um, shareholders who are like, wait, you didn't tell us you got breached and I had $11 million stolen or whatever the case is, ransomed. So I think it, it, there is some sort of 
PR move to say, yeah, well, this is the problem we had and here's what we did to resolve it and we're going to get back online. Um, some places just don't have an option because it's like, um, you know, our evil hit 19 different government agencies in Texas in one day. And it's like, well, what's going on with Texas government? Uh, you know, you can't really hide that or sweep that under the rug. So you, you really have to come out and say something. Um, so, so, you know, sometimes you just don't have a choice. Absolutely. I think one of the things that we deal with in the industrial sector a lot is people just don't think it can happen to them. Either they're not on the radar or they're too small, um, whatever the case may be. What are some of the what piece of advice you might want to offer to people in terms of it can happen to you? You are on the radar. Everybody is visible, especially when these hackers are really going after the industrial sector right now. We've seen such a huge uptick in activity within our industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was surprised of, of, of our evil, just sticking with them for a minute, is, um, you know, they're a ransomware group. And what, you know, our, our, our suggestion to uh, avoid this is to have good proper backups. And if you do get ransomware, you've got a backup solution all ready to go. Well, our evil knew this. I mean, they, they heard this <laughs> suggestion many times. So their first thing they do is they look for where your backups are and delete that and then ransomware you. So it, you, you we often have these plans in place of oh yeah i've got that you know if this if worst case scenario we still have this you know and if that goes down we still have that um you, what, i love this quote by mike tyson everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face <laughs> yep. and then it's like okay i don't know what to do anymore right and so i think a lot of people are, are feeling that is and that and that's why i like to do my podcast because i'm like well, what was that like that day that you got punched in the face um yeah plan a was screwed plan b was screwed plan c was screwed like what did what did you end up doing oh, i had to do it all by hand or something like that right um so yeah i mean i think uh, ransomware in particular or uh, malware i guess in general is is just not one of these set and forget kind of things there's just not a a solution that you can buy that'll last a whole year much less five or ten years to keep you safe and protected it's an ongoing thing right so just because you got something um a solution in place typically means you're going to make it harder for this round of ransomware or, or viruses or whatever, but they're going to iterate. They're going to get better. They're going to figure out what, what, you know, safeguards you have in place and then get around that. So, um, it's just something you have to constantly keep up and maintain in order to just stay ahead of the threat. Yeah, it's, it is, it's an ongoing battle without a doubt. And I'm glad you brought up ransomware attacks. Those are a big part of what's going on in the industrial sector right now. And another reason why people just want to keep it quiet, they don't want to admit to some of the ransoms that they've paid. In your experience in working with some of these folks that have been victims of ransomware attacks, it's amazing to me how complex these organizations are. I guess maybe you could speak to that, sort of the, the evolution of it. It's no longer a kid sitting in his grandma's basement. These are incredible organizations that are very complex, very well put together, and have a definite plan of attack. Yeah, um, our evil, for example, because we're still there, yeah. um, they, um, they are a ransomware as a service, right? So they set up the whole, if you are, have access into anyone's network, you can then use our service to inflict, infect the whole network, and then you, uh, um, you know, we'll take it from there. We'll organize. We'll, we'll you know, we've got uh, Tor chats where we can um, tell the people like, here's where you can go to uh, negotiate a ransom and get your decryption keys. Um, we'll even put the, put put their thumb our thumb in their eye, right, and call them on the yeah. phone and say, look, um, why haven't you paid the ransom? Or do you want us to publicly post the stuff that we've stolen um, and all this extra stuff, right? So. And, and, you know, they might even DDoS them after the fact too. Like, okay, we see you're down. Let's make you really down. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you've got some, you've got some pretty crazy criminals out there. And I, and at, at this point I'm even calling them cyber gangs because it's, uh, it's ruthless. It's, it's awful. It's evil. And it's, uh, you know, it's just like, just bad. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it is becoming pretty sophisticated on, on who's attacking and what the software is and, and how it's getting in and stuff like that. Yeah, those distributed denial of service attacks are a big part of what our readers are dealing with or our listeners are dealing with as well. We've even heard now that there's customer service elements of these ransomware as a service groups. Um, you know, they have an HR department where they're recruiting people, all of this. Um, it, it's really incredible. The organization that they've become as opposed to just even a gang, I guess. Yeah, the, um, the thing I noticed uh, recently or heard about is um, on the other side, right? So you're hit with ransomware and you're like, okay, they're, they're asking for like a $5 million ransom. How in the world do I even deal with this? 
Um, yeah. On that side of things, there's uh, also a, a, a service. Um, uh, I guess there are probably um, maybe a small industry of people who are ransomware negotiators, right? So if you try to go to bit to buy Bitcoin, like a million dollars in Bitcoin, um, well, that's difficult. Um, you know, there's limits on how much you can buy. Yeah. Uh, and if you tell them, hey, I'm here to buy a ransom, uh, you know, buy enough Bitcoin for to pay a ransom, I don't think that's legal. I think they have to not let you buy Bitcoin. Really? So how do you, um, yeah, it's um, it's it's just like, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't think it's legal. So um, if, they, if they know that's what you're gonna use it for. Yeah, right. So, um, I mean, you're, you're, you're basically saying, uh, I mean, I'm going to use this for criminal activity. Right. And so they can't like, oh, okay, we'll let you buy that. Like, it's just not worth it. Um, so, so what do you do? Right. So you can deal with these ransomware negotiators who are like, oh yeah, you got hit with that one. Okay. I, I kind of, I know I've, I've dealt with them before. Um, here's how we can do it. Uh, how much are they willing to, how much are they asking? 1 million. Okay. Well, um, you know, here's our fee. It's 10%. So one, one million, one hundred thousand dollars or whatever. And, um, we'll get on the chats with them. We'll negotiate the thing. We'll get the key and we'll help you unlock it. And then you can just pay us, um, you know, uh, monthly payments or whatever the case is. I don't know how, what the deals are there, but I just feel, feel like that's a side of it that I never heard of before, which is pretty wild. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Kind of like what was it a Russell Crowe movie, Proof of Life, or something like that? They had the negotiator they brought in to uh, for a hostage situation. Um, really interesting. You know, speaking of ransomware, a little bit too. I, and I guess there's two ways of looking at it. When you ask, "Do you pay the ransom?" There's what everybody says, which they say don't, because then you're just basically funding more attacks down the line. But then there's the reality, especially in the industrial sector, when you've got downtime. When you're talking about machines being shut down. Um, Colonial pipeline example, not being able to get resources out to people who need it for their cars, their homes, whatever the case may be. Jack, I guess, what are you hearing or what's your insight in terms of what you should do versus maybe the realities of the situation when it comes to paying these ransoms? Yeah, I mean, I think the the general advice is don't pay it. Um, figure right. out another way. Um, take the <laughs> take the, the hit on it. But um yeah, that's the problem, right? If your backups are gone, if your customer, if you are the one who got your customers infected, right? So, you know, this has happened before where somebody gets into a place that, you know, their software is in their customer's network. Now all their customers just got infected with ransomware. Do you do it? Do you have, you know, something that you need to give your customers? <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. for infecting you. Here's the thing. <laughs> but um, I think the uh, the advice the FBI has is just call them up. Um, call the FBI, tell them, hey, look, you've been hit. Um, with ransomware and here's the situation and to do it sooner than later because the earlier they can work the sooner they can figure out um, you know what's going on and, and, and stuff like that so um, we've seen this before where the FBI has been contacted and worked with victims to get you know maybe a little bit of clues here and a little bit of clues there and keep working with victims eventually they get enough clues um, and uh, can can find these these people and sometimes even work with, um, you know, uh, ex Bitcoin exchanges and stuff like that to get the get the Bitcoin from from the, you know, out of the criminals yeah. hands or uh, attack those wallets in such a way to get the recover those funds and this kind of stuff, too. So, um, yeah, I've, I've seen them say it over and over again, call the FBI when you're when you're hit with ransomware and we'll we'll help you work it out. I don't understand that myself because it's like. Well, what if my barber shop's WordPress site gets ransomware? Is that big enough for the <laughs> FBI to care about it, right? Like, so I don't know right. what the level is of. Okay, here's this thing, but I think a lot of your listeners may be involved with industrials type stuff, and yeah, yeah, it probably is big enough for the FBI to be okay. Let's take a look at this. Absolutely. So let me set the table for you a little bit, Jack, and maybe you can borrow from some of your past professional experiences. But in a lot of situations, we'll have plant managers, IT managers, who are basically saying. We need to increase, we need to invest in cybersecurity um, platforms. We need to invest in some of these, maybe these um, uh, different penetration testing, whatever the case may be to find our vulnerabilities. But upper management struggles with allocating those funds for those types of resources. Could you maybe help some of our listeners who are in that situation? How can they convince upper management this needs to be a bigger priority than what it currently is? Mm, that is something that's... Uh... I guess a sore spot with me is because when I was working 10 years as a network security engineer, I had a hard time pushing that boulder up the hill and really wished that security came from the highest level. You know, the, the owner, the CEO, 
made that the initiative because if the, having them convince the company this is what's important will actually work having me try to convince upwards is never going to work um okay. so a couple things like um you know the best best way to sell fire insurance is to watch the building across the street burn down right so yeah. if you can show people maybe management or whatever like here's our competitor and here's how they got hit or here's how a similar business of ours got hit um and this is what they did wrong and this is what they did right um that might be enough to say holy cow that we we're really lucky we, that didn't happen to us right so some of those close call situations that you might see in the news that are um you know in your industry or whatever i think do really help um figure out like okay we yeah. we really need to step it up here cuz this could happen to us right um Absolutely. i think that one is is pretty effective Cool. You know, some of my favorite episodes of Darknet are when you have some of those penetration testers on and they talk about the process that they went through and, and what they found out and kind of what it showed um, the companies that they were working for. In particular, I think that was the last episode, actually. You made a statement along the lines of you can't be afraid of what you'll find during these types of tests. Could you maybe talk on that a little bit in some of your personal experiences as well as some of the people you've had on the podcast? And you, you can't be afraid of doing these things because you can't be afraid of what you find out about your own company. Yeah, I mean, personal experiences. We had to have a, a penetration test to be uh, certified, or um, you know, I think it was a, um, some sort of a, a, you know quality assurance thing. Um, and so when we first got our penetration tester in there, we were like, "Hey, um, whoa, <laughs> hold on a second. We have somebody outside the company coming in, and they're going to test like all the passwords in our entire company and hit all the things. And be like, this is a attacker just unleashing a, a swarm of bees in the network. This is going to be crazy." What are they going to do? What are they going to find? And now we have this person who can see people's passwords and stuff. Like it was just, it was a mess to uh, just get your head a lot around and, and be okay. And so I, I made them sit down next to me at the desk next to me and say, I'm going to watch everything you do. And I want to know step by step of what's happening. And, and that really enlightened me, you know, and they were very professional and it was very helpful. And yeah, I thought, okay, this is a great service. Let's do this year after year. Um, but yeah, it is one of those things that, um, you know, there's a level of maturity first before you want to have a penetration test. But once you get to a, a certain point where you need to, you know, secure your your assets in the network and this kind of stuff, um, it's important, I think, to um, get penetration tests on your own company and do uh, outside assessments to see what have you missed, what are you blind to, and um, really, um, really be vulnerable to it because the. Yeah. the uh, this can really help you uh, find some blind spots that you, um, you that they are going to save your butt later on down the line. Absolutely. You know, I'm sure you get asked this a lot, Jack. Are there, when you look at the time, you've been doing the podcast for a while now, since 2020, or was it before that? I think um, 2018. 2018. During all that time, are there any episodes or any guests that you really remember that really stick out, um, just really had an impact on you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I really like the ones that just make me think in ways that I didn't get, right? Because a lot of this is like, okay, um, I understand what a you know an a incident response is, or a penetration test, or what ransomware is, you know, and it's just kind of going through the motions. Okay, another one of these, but um, I think the one where I interviewed the guy from uh, the Pirate Bay really st just screwed up my whole mental process because <laughs> this is a guy. Who, I mean, I think the Pirate Bay is a website that's been tried to cancel, you know, the most canceled website in the world, right? So, you know, DNS providers have blocked them. Whole countries have blocked them. I, every ISP in Sweden has blocked them. Uh, they're, they're, they've they're gone to court and they've been put in jail and this website is still up and working. So number one, there's a whole resiliency thing there of how to, how to keep your website going even when you go to prison. <laughs> But then number yeah. two is like, how come it didn't go down when you went to prison? What's going on there? <laughs> and, right. and all the things that they did to try to legitimize it and get public um, interest behind it and stuff like that. It was it, it was such a wild ride, that that website. And it's still up today. And uh, I just, I, the the guy I interviewed, Peter, um, he, uh, he just has such a unique view of the whole world of like, um, you know, his mission and his ideology and stuff like that just made me... It's just, it kind of broke my whole mental process of how I see the world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, looking forward a little bit, we're always interested in, in what might be coming down the road. Based on the folks that you've talked to and, and just your proximity to cybersecurity in general, 
do you see any big trends, any new developments that we should be really on the lookout for over the next, I don't know, 12 to 18 months? I think the uh, whatever bot problem we have today is like child's play. <laughs> we're like that. Yeah. We'll look at that um, in a few years and be like, "Oh, that was so cute when we just had <laughs> like bots back in 2022." Um, so uh, yeah, I think AI and bots are going to get crazy. Like they're going to just get so sophisticated. They're going to be um, flooding us in ways that we I can't anticipate. We're not creative enough to see. Um, they're outsmarting us in ways that we're just not smart enough to get through. And uh, it, like, it's just going to be um, quite a uh, sophisticated, I mean, if you can just imagine an extremely sophisticated AI um, and swarm of bots that are like being created, like it's going to, it's going to, it's going to redo our entire security mindset of, well, this is how we have to deal with it. Like, hopefully, <laughs> what I always hope is whenever you know, the enemy um, figures out some sort of new weapon or tool or something that we can use that technology to fight against it, right? So if we have um, quantum computing that breaks all encryption, um, you know, because they can just crack anything instantly, um, hopefully that quantum computer can then make an encryption mechanism that's hard so too hard for a quantum computer even to solve right so that's kind of your hope right is okay yeah. even though we get to this new technology we have now a new technology to beat to make it even harder and so hopefully with ai bots being just running amok uh we can then use some we can then program some sort of ai to block this to detect this to figure it out to interact with it and to to defend against it so yeah, i'm really really fascinated with that ai bot uh, or just AI in general, and it's going to be wild to see what what blooms out of there. Maybe I'm getting too far into the weeds here, but from a, a manufacturer's perspective or industrial infrastructure provider's perspective, what would these AI bots be going after? What, what impact could it potentially have on them specifically? Mm, yeah, I mean, you can you you you, you can maybe automate attack bots, right? Um, so you can just see them doing that. Um, you can automate um, user behavior or login accounts or uh, trying to uh, flood your, you know, I don't know, uh, your your logins and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I just see that um, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to just throw monkey wrenches and everything. Yeah, just kind of basically all the probing that they could do, any soft spots, they're going to have that much more that they can throw at it um, with artificial intelligence backing up everything that they're doing. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, you know, how long did it take us to like master, how, does, how long does it take a human to master chess? Uh, you know, maybe yeah. 20 years or more. Um, uh, but with AI today, it takes them an hour, right? And so if <laughs> you can figure out how to be, and, and this is from, I, here are no rules for the chess game, just figure out on your own AI, just figure out on your own from scratch. I'm not going to tell you how to play this game at all. And it can figure out how to play and master the game within one hour. I mean, if that's what we're dealing with, imagine like your worst threat actor ever going from yeah. nothing to a master, uh, a master nemesis in one hour. <laughs> like it, it, it's, it's nightmare. Absolutely. Well, you know, trying to end this on a little bit of a happy note here, when we look at everything that's going on with the attackers versus the white hats that are out there, what's the disparity? Are, are the good guys always chasing the bad guys? Are, are we close? How would you sort of set that up? Mm, there's something I, I heard uh, Matty Stone say recently, um, one of the Google Project Zero folks, um, that there's this difference between um, private state of the art and public state of the art, right? So there's the public state of the art is what we know is the capabilities out there, what we have patched for and this kind of thing. But the private state of the art is stuff we don't know that the attackers have. And it's kind of a mystery and you've got to get creative on what could this technology be used for or this protocol or this application or something like that. And we don't know until the attackers actually ex show their hand and expose it. And so that's, um, that is a really interesting concept to see that gap. And uh, and there are companies out there like Project Zero and uh, Trends uh, Zero Day Initiative that do try to, uh, you know, incentivize people to come forward and, and do research in these areas and figure out, you know, how could you 
break a, a, a Tesla or how could you yeah. break a home Wi-Fi router or this kind of thing. And because and without the incentive of like, hey, go and poke at that, um, then we're only left with the with sort of the bad guys poking at it. So um, it, it is good to see people doing research into the space um, when we don't even know if there is a vulnerability there. We're just trying to figure it out so that we can close that gap between the two. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, you, you brought up Tesla and it kind of got me thinking a little bit. One of the debates that kind of takes place within the industrial sector is where embedded security, where those responsibilities for that embedded security lies, whether it's with the manufacturer or with its, when it's with the designer, the product designer. Have you had any kind of conversations there in terms of who needs to make sure something like an, like an iPhone is secure? Is it the people developing the chips or is it the folks assembling it and putting it all together and marketing it and putting it out there? I think there's two more legs on that on that equation there, which is um, the users, right? The users can get a secure thing and make it insecure. They can do bad things on there and, and just expose <laughs> yeah. themselves. Yeah. But then there's also policy and law, right? Um, is somebody should someone be held accountable for having vulnerable uh, software out there, or how much trouble should they get into if somebody hacks into this and exposes it and this sort of thing? So it's kind of the question of like who who's in charge of making the road safe. Is it the driver, the car maker, the civil engineer? <laughs> yeah. Or, um, or yeah, or the police. Um, yeah, and so it is a little bit of all of us. And I think we all have to um, do our do our duty to be be part of that to make everything safe. There, it's not just on the software maker. I think um, you know, talking about AI in the future, I think like uh, you know, auto driving cars and this kind of thing may have like a questionnaire when you when you get them of like okay would you like this to be altruistic mode um, or self egotistic mode and so the, the, <laughs> the option is if we have to crash this car should we save your life or save as much life as we can because either we might crash into a crowd of people but you'll be safe or we'll crash into a wall save the crowd of people but you'll die yeah. and that's going to be a really like you, the software maker may not want that on their shoulders. They may just pass yeah. it off to you as the driver. And now you can say, oh, please save my life. And, and I don't care if we kill 20 people, but I, as long as I'm alive. And that is, a, yeah. that is gonna be wild stuff to grapple with. Thanks, Jack. And I can't encourage everyone enough to check out Darknet Diaries wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining us today. To catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. For Jack Resider, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.